five, four, three, two. We are live. We can start. So good evening, friends. Uh, today is the sixth day of uh, Bone and Joint Week, and uh, today we have uh, very, very uh, eminent cardiac, cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, cardiologist, Dr. Praveen Chandra, who is the head and chairman of Intervention Cardiologists at uh, Medanta, Gurgaon, and he'll be speaking about that uh, how we can. have those telltale signs as a doctor where we can think that yes probably it's a cardiac issue what are the things which are being done latest into cardiology and intervention cardiology so you can have a lot of questions from him directly uh, and uh, there'll be a small presentation there after we'll have a question answer session so before i start i will uh, i'll request our president up orthopedic association dr sanjay dhawan to given his opening is uh, mark dr sanjay dhawan yeah good evening and welcome you all to this health webinar now we all welcome our eminent speaker for the evening today padma shri awardee dr praveen chandra sir who is an indian cardiologist and chairman of interventional cardiology at medanta the medicity gurgaon Dr. Chandra was born in 1963 at Gorakhpur and best known for interventional cardiology. He is recognized as one of the leaders in angioplasty in the country, and is proficient in a lot of new devices and technology. We are very much delighted to be a listener to his speech and sure enough to carry a lesson from for lifetime as for our cardiac health and subsequent general well-being is concerned to improve upon the utility, quality of our life. So. over to you sir because we want to listen from you we don't i don't want to come between you and the listeners hope that this is going to help us in many ways thank you and welcome again to everyone ravi chandra sir thank you thank you dr gawan dr noop and dr purva and all the faculty and dr tarun singhal for uh, inviting me today to give this talk And also share some thoughts about uh, uh, you know the community of cardiology and orthopedic integrates. All that because uh, we keep doing, keep having patients where there is a common link, and the common link as we can see now because you people have moved from fractures to joint replacement, and these joint replacement patients are really elderly patients. There are multiple morbidities, comorbidities, and then we have to work together to really, you know, find out the best option for these patients. So we will discuss that. I will also discuss, as Dr. Apoor Anup said, about how to protect us, how to protect doctors from the scourge of, uh, you know, cardiovascular problems, because as age advances, it won't, uh, you know, leave anybody behind. So we have to. Kind of uh, be careful, and we have to be, you know, fit. So because our peak working actually starts. That is the problem. I mean, this is everybody realizes this that the, for the doctor, the peak earning and the peak work starts after fifty, and the disease also starts affecting after fifty. So those, you know, very productive years of fifty to seventy for a doctor is very very important. Is why we have to be careful. So we'll go through all that, and of course, then whatever questions you have, I will be very happy to answer. So now, can I share the screen to start the presentation? Okay. So, my friends, Chandra sir, we are getting some dis. Chandra sir, please, may I interrupt you? We are getting some disturbances probably with your headphone, maybe. Okay. okay. So now, is it okay now? Still, it's coming. Just remove it, and then, like you were saying before, we can do that. Let me uh, speak a little louder. I think this will be better for you. No, nah. right? yeah, yeah, this is better, sir. Fine. So, as you all have been progressing in the field of orthopedics, moving from fractures to joint replacements, and so on and so forth, and you are also going from very invasive to a 
semi or very less invasive approach through you know you use uh, you know small endoscopes etc to do all those joint repairs and things like that so similarly in heart treatment we have moved because 30 years back the only treatment for blocked arteries was bypass surgery but today bypass surgery has been replaced in a very big way and almost it has taken over it has taken over the number of bypass surgeries around the world and uh, interventional cardiology is a new field which has developed in the last 25 30 years it is done by cardiologists so i am not a cardiac surgeon but of course cardiac surgeon are my friends and uh, so we work together as a heart team but this interventional work which is actually a non invasive way of treating blockages of the heart arteries and also replacing valves now they replace valves without doing any surgery so i'll go through all these new things which we are doing i won't go into you know details of course new drugs have come up and many of you know that uh, the anticoagulation new drugs which are known as doax or noax are very easily given to these patients where we want to prevent thrombus formation in heart or in the leg arteries especially in you know in patients who are undergoing uh, long term you know immobilization or having a thromboembolism dvt in these patients we give these drugs known as noax but now they are known as doax why they are known as doax because they are direct oral anticoagulants then in acute coronary syndrome and acute mi there are new drugs like you know antiplatelets which are very effective but i know you hate that these antiplatelets because when they are on you cannot do surgery so in these patients we have to stop antiplatelets for about 2 3 days or 4 days and then you can do your orthopedic surgery for hypertension we have very effective methods we have devices now to treat blockages of the heart arteries the carotid arteries for prevention of stroke and for renal arteries for prevention of high blood pressure accelerated high blood pressure can be controlled with renal artery treat treatment and of course for peripheral you know claudication now we can put stents in the peripheral arteries so that the patients can get relief of claudication so all this is now being done by the cardiologist a lot of these things earlier what cardiologist was doing he was giving medicines he was doing ecg he was you know controlling heart failure but now we are into curative treatment and prevention of problems like stroke prevention like you know gangrene prevention and of course diseases of aorta are also now treated by us by putting stent grafts and structures of the heart and genital heart disease hypertension cardiogenic shock when patients are very sick we used to say we cannot do anything now it is too late now we have methods to treat them also and prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation and heart failure so a cardiologist has now become a cardiovascular specialist so we have started from heart but now we are treating from the entire body starting in the brain arteries going up to the leg arteries everything renal arteries aorta everything then the brachial arteries so when sometimes patients come to us with claudication of the upper limb and you know they used they came to us with suspicion of angina because sometimes people say that if we walk and or do anything and develop pain in the arm that means it is angina but in these patients we found that there were blockages in the subclavian artery and then we can do stent implantation in subclavian artery which is very easy to do and these patients really do very well then claudication of the lower legs these patients you know earlier we had no options except surgery and very you know ineffective medications but now intervention is a very big way of treating claudication of lower legs and also uh, you know sometimes patients have uh, abdominal aortic stenosis or abdominal aortic aneurysms which can be treated because they are serious problems so from the entire body vascular system so cardiologists are now known as cardiovascular specialists so now the need of a sternotomy is very much obviated there is very small chance that a person will need a bypass surgery or median sternotomy because we have many other methods 
And one of these methods they have developed in Medanta is the minimally invasive method or hybrid coronary revascularization. So what we do is in a hybrid surgery, we have a hybrid cath lab, which is one of the unique cath labs where a surgeon and a cardiologist can work together in the same OT. So this is a OT and a cath lab, which is a robotic cath lab, which is fitted over here. So they work on this robotic system for the grafting from the side of the chest and we do angioplasty at the same time. So what you can see here is that we put a stent in one of the arteries or two arteries and in one artery where stent cannot be put, we do a grafting to a small keyhole approach. And this is known as hybrid revascularization where we are combining the benefits of both. This is how, uh, this is a patient with vessel disease. He had to undergo bypass. But here, what you can see is we did a hybrid. We put a you know, graft from here to the small holes and the sternum is totally you know, spared. No need to do any sternotomy and put stents from the arteries and he is done. So all the three arteries, four blockages are treated and he is doing fine without any major chest surgery. And he can be discharged in three days time because these holes are very, very small holes. So this is how the benefits of integration of technology is happening. And this is what we call as best of both worlds. We give the best of both worlds to the patient, but wherever he can get the maximum benefit out of it. And of course, medications we do. Then we have, you know, stents today, we have medicated stents actually. We started with angioplasty, which was, and that time when I, I remember when we used to do angioplasty, we had to inform the surgical team that we are doing angioplasty and if there is a problem, please, you know, uh, bail us out by doing emergency surgery. But touch foot now in the last so many years, there is no need for a, a bailout surgery or an emergency surgery. And that is why many centers now have cath labs without a surgical standby. So that is not required, especially in routine cases. In complex cases, certainly we do. Then we have absorbable stents now where the stents inside the body dissolve and they are very effective. Then yes. we have advances in decision making because many times you must have heard after angiography, somebody says angioplasty karao, somebody is saying bypass karao, ko kata hai, ki do nothing. So is there a definite way to find out? Yes. We have very definite ways which are known as FFR, IVAS and OCT by which we can tell whether this blockage, a particular blockage is having a you know, symptom relation or not. And that we can find out for each and every blockage after angiography. If there are four blockages, there is no need to put four stents. If we do FFR, we find that the FFR is positive in two only or one only, just put one stent. And that is why we use this technology known as FFR. So to decide whether a patient needs angioplasty or just needs uh, medications, we can decide by that. Then we have intravascular ultrasound where a small probe can go inside the arteries and they can start imaging inside and you can see how we can find out. These are the images which we find out by a intravascular ultrasound. They are very routinely used in our labs now and very, very accurate, very effective, and it improves the outcomes. When we do angioplasty, we look at that from internally and then see whether the stent is good, well done or not. Now, this is a three-dimensional this is online. I mean, this we do it immediately and on the patient. This is a patient where angioplasty is being done. This is the wire inside the arteries. And here you can see that we are able to see the entire artery from inside, knowing the stent is fully deployed, properly working or not. And that is why you can improve or get a predictable outcome in a particular patient. So almost surety is confirmed once we do all these technologies. Of course, everything costs money, but it is really worth it. And we can take these pictures. So you can see in a patient like where stent has been put after six months and after two years, the artery is completely healed and we can check it with this OCT. Then uh, many times now, as uh, Dr. Agarwal was asking, how do we find out in general whether a person is going to have a heart attack or not? I will have some discussion on that. But this is the biggest challenge. How do we find out that this person is going to have a heart attack. Because once heart attack happens, anybody can treat it. I mean, there's no big deal. But the problem is we have to know if we can find out if there is a chance. So now there are new methods 
like doing a 25th, 256th slide CT scan, where we can reconstruct the arteries in a normal healthy individual, like you can see here. We can see that the, there is no blockage here, but in this patient, there is calcification, which was found on CT scanning. And on this CT calcium scoring, we found that the score is high. So this patient will have to be checked further. And uh, we can find out if there is a suspicion of a blockage or any other problem, and we can make the decision as to whether he should start medicines now or not. So knowing this, the, these patients can be put on early medications. Because up till now, what we were doing, we were just responding to what patients was coming with. The patients are coming with heart attack, then you start medications. Then what happens? You're already late. So we are now talking of a situation where we can prevent heart attacks. We can prevent heart disease. And there are new medicines also which are being made, which are now into the picture, which are preventing heart attacks, preventing heart failures. And then we can know the metabolism of the heart by doing a PET scan, where if the blockage of the artery is there and on the PET scan, we see no metabolism, there's no need to do angioplasty. That means the heart is dead. But if the metabolism is there and the blockage is there, that means if you open the artery, he will be relieved. He will protect his heart. He will prevent him, we will prevent him from a heart attack. So that is the PET scan. The PET scan test is done in heart and it is non, done to know the metabolic activity in the heart. Then in high risk cases, we do, you know, in uh, intraortic balloon pump insertion, and then, you know, we do early angioplasty these days. So if there is a patient who is very sick, BP is coming to 70 systolic, 60 systolic, we take these patients up as soon as possible. So here the dictum is that the sun should not set on this patient or the sun should not rise on this patient. If you have wasted a few hours, six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, and you have done nothing, this patient is not going to come back to you because he's going to die if he's cardiogenic shock. So the early dictum is that we have to act very fast, very, very fast. And that is why early invasive therapy is useful. Then, uh, I'll quickly go to this uh, <clears throat> new method, which uh, we have started doing for the last seven, eight years, where we are replacing the valve of the heart by doing a transcatheter procedure, where you do not have to cut out anything. This valve is implanted inside the heart with the you know, femoral arterial approach, where a small tube will go inside. And you can see through the same, as some, the same as the catheter of angiography or angioplasty, so the a little slightly bigger catheter is taken inside and on this guide wire, we take this catheter, the valve is loaded already on this. And when we reach the position of the valve, the valve is released and the earlier valve, the native valve is stuck on the side. It becomes like a holder of this new valve. And then this new valve starts functioning immediately. You can see that the valve is being released at the site of a old sir, valve. I mean, sir, can I interfere? Uh, yes, yes. I think your screen is not shared. I can't see anything here. Really? Oh my, my God. screen. I think we, are, we all can see it. We, oh, all we can. See we are able to see. There will be some, okay. there will be some okay. trouble in your. There's room. something wrong on my side. Okay, I'll oh, check. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Sorry okay. for interrupting, sir. Okay, 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 okay. So, can should I do anything now? No, 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 sir. Please, you continue. Okay. okay you okay. continue, sir. We will correct you. Okay. So this is the transfemoral now new technique of replacing the heart valve without surgery. So surgeons are not very happy with this new development, but certainly uh, we have to accept that if something you know non-invasive can be done to a person, especially who is above the age of 65, 70, 75, and the valve is diseased, then they don't need to go any surgery. The patient is done under local anesthesia and there is no stitch, there is no cut. And in these valves, as you can see here, this is a diseased aortic valve. In this, we can replace this valve without doing any surgery. So this is uh, how it looks in the valves. These are the devices which we are using. So I won't go into the details of this. And uh, I'll quickly show you something uh, more. And how do we do the planning? Actually, we do all the planning by CT. So CT is a very important uh, you know, investigation for everybody today, for you also and for us also. And here, this is how we do it. This is the cath lab where we are doing this. You see, we are checking it 
from the other side from where we have to go and this is the hybrid cath lab where we are doing it and the patient is awake so you can imagine uh, this procedure is rather simple of course nothing is so simple but <laughs> certainly it is uh, this is how the valve is implanted you can see the valve is implanted inside and we are checking the uh, you know the uh, pressures the ecg everything is coming and we are everything is under control okay so this is how then we then we check if everything is okay and the closure site is like this so this is the surgery where we open the chest and this is the percutaneous technique of replacing the valve through this small tube we do that and then once it is done there are small threads we just pull it and then it is closed so that is the advantage and then the patients are in the ward the next day and these are some of the typical patients you can see where surgery could not be done because this is a patient young patient though but he was 140 kilo so the surgeons all the surgeons refused in delhi everybody refused so we did the tabby well and he is doing well about 8 years now and these are all elderly patient he is 82 years or 84 years so basically uh, you know elderly patients are very very you know benefited by this technology then transcatheter mitral valve because sometimes what happens is that you know we uh, such, such patients who have earlier valve surgery and now the valve is degenerated what to do so we do a valve in valve procedure where without surgery now we can replace the valve as i as we did for the aortic valve we can do the mitral valve also and these are some of the valves we can do the last thing i am going to show you is the mitra clip where in a leaking valve what we do is we put a clip just like the surgeon puts a stitch we put a clip without any surgery and that's how we do it then you know this is all is done to a trans esophageal echo and you can see the echo images so that's how you know basically we are treating uh, many of our patients today and then you know sometimes patients are given alcohol but not to drink we give two drops of alcohol inside the artery to close the artery when they are very hypertin you know trophic in hypertrophic heart we do this treatment known as uh, you know alcohol septal ablation icd is another treatment where we put a pacemaker which actually controls the tachycardia and these high risk patients we put icd in these patients then now you must have heard of ecmo in the last uh, wave of uh, covid we were actually using ecmo in many patients where the blood pressure was collapsing the patients were having the acute uh, uh, cardiogenic shock then we put these patients in a veno arterial ax veno arterial ecmo which is known as extra corporeal membrane oxygenator with a pump so the blood is sucked out from the vein and injected back into the aorta this is known as ecmo and we do this in this uh, cardiac patients but now in covid patients when they become with very severe lung problems then the blood is taken from the vein oxygenated and pushed back into the aorta so that was ecmo and it was it was quite effective of course the mortality of you know covid itself was so high so it was not working so well in weak hearts we do a biventricular pacing with the three wires and so on and so forth so i think you know and of course so many congenital heart problems are now treated by putting the devices and this is kind of a hole in the heart which is treated very simply one day admission nothing no surgery and these asds are very easily so 90% asds today is treated by device implantation surgery is not to be done then in the left atrial appendage occlusion for elderly patients with atrial fibrillation who cannot take medications we do this procedure known as la appendage closure i'll just show you a quick picture this is how we put it so this is the umbrella which we put it in the left atrial appendage through a percutaneous technique again and then the patient doesn't need to take oral anticoagulation so that is for prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation and now we have uh, devices to control high blood pressure also if the bp is not getting control on medicine now we have a therapy known as renal nerve denervation through a approach and then these four these are aneurysms which we have been treating for many years now if there is a big aneurysm we put a stent graft here so these are the techniques which i wanted to share with you today uh, interventional cardiology has become too big now and uh, very effective and i'm happy 
that I'm living in this era of new development of interventional cardiology. Thank you very much. I'm sure you have questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Praveen, sir. It was really enlightening talk. I have a few questions. Uh, can I start asking you, sir? <laughs> Bombardment of the questions. Yeah. So, as an orthopedic surgeon, as you in the starting said, that there are a lot of patients, elderly patient comes to us. So the biggest dilemma I have seen is that normally as a pre-op checkup, what we do is we do an ECG and ECO because most of the, uh, these uh, osteoarthritic patient or a fracture patient, they cannot go for any stress test. And what I have experienced in my 20 years odd practice that at least I know 10 of the patients who had gone with full checkup through the physician, okay, went for the surgery and five months, six months down the line, they had a cardiac issue and a, a complete bypass, three artery bypass was being done. So I am apprehensive from medical legal point of view and what should be the right investigation or right approach for these kind of patients? Okay, so very good question. How to get a cardiac clearance in an orthopedic surgery patient, right? Yeah. Now the thing is, the we have to, of course, the physician has to take the history and uh, check the history of the patient if there is any cardiac history or any previous bypass surgery or any previous angioplasty or high risk features like patient is diabetic for a long time. So in these patients who are above the age of 40 years, I must say, 35 to 40 years, in these patients, the investigation to be done is a ECG and a stress echo. Now the problem is if the patient cannot walk, because many times your patients cannot walk, especially who are above the age of 65, 70 years and are having, you know, you are going to take him for a knee transplant. So in these patients, the test to be done is a dobutamine stress echo is the recommendation. Okay. Okay. So echo is not good enough. So that is why sometimes we see that the patient was taken for surgery without doing any stress examination. So a dobutamine stress echo is essential, but if the patient has a low ejection fraction on ECO or has it having ECG changes or has symptoms, then these patients must undergo an angiography test before you do the uh, major orthopedic surgery. Because uh, in these high-risk patients, but it is only for those patients who are having uh, any low ejection fraction or who are the above age, age of 50 years, 55 years, long time standing diabetics, there I think this is recommended. Otherwise, routine screening is by stress echo if he can walk. If he cannot walk, dobutamine stress echo. That is the best thing to do. So we do for every patient the same way. Okay. Thank you, sir. I have another question that we do get patients who had gone through CABG or bypass and all that. They are equisprin, atorvastatin and all those drugs. Now, uh, we, do, we do stop these drugs for four to five days. Uh, when to restart these drugs? For how long can we keep it um, on the side? And uh, what are the risks if we, st we are stopping it for, let's say, two weeks or so? Okay. So there will be two types of patients. One is a previous bypass surgery or previous angioplasty patients. So in a previous bypass surgery patient, if the you know surgery was done more than a year back or angioplasty was done more than a year back, there is no problem. You can start stop antiplatelet four days before or five days before and then do the surgery. And after, within 24 hours, you can restart the antiplatelets. There is no problem. But if there is a patient who is oozing too much or is having too much of collection, then you can delay it for another 24 hours. Okay. okay? Right. And then, uh, and that is for antiplatelets and anticoagulations. Antiplatelet means aspirin, clopidogrel, ticagrel, or and prasugrel. antiplatelets. Or fir baat hai ki what happens to the statins, cholesterol medications. There is no need to stop it. Earlier, it was a recommendation many years back that if you are doing a deep surgery, then stop statins. But now it is not recommended to be stopped. Then do not stop any antihypertensive or any other medications during this process. Now, the last thing is most tricky part is those patients who have a valve inside the heart. 
especially a you know metallic valve in these patients you have to stop anticoagulation four five days before and then you have to put these patients on low molecular weight heparin injection and then 12 hours before the surgery you can the last shot should be given like for example you are doing the surgery tomorrow morning so you can give the last shot tonight and that's all do not give in the morning and then you can do your surgery then within the next 24 hours you can restart the low molecular weight heparin and then reinitiate the oral anticoagulation that is the method to do this okay, okay. so for the first set of patients where people have gone cabg or uh, bypass a year back we have stopped it for four days so uh, my question was post op period how long can it be because we are worried even in the post op period for collections you know something like hip replacement knee replacement or big orthopedic surgery so can we keep it off for next five days or so when the risk of hematoma formation is right yeah i mean you can but generally the thing is that what we see is within 24 hours your bleeding stop and you know the collection starts becoming too little so there will be very odd patient where the there is a major bleeder which is left behind or something then it's a different thing but routine surgeries i think what i see here is that uh, within 24 hours they the next day they are trying to remove the drains etc and that is the time when you should start if there is no collection less than 25 ml less than 50 ml you are fine perfect thank you sir do we have any more questions yes uh, uh, dr pravin this is dr harish bakra from lucknow yeah and uh, i just wanted to know that uh, the your the replacement of the wall has been done now how long is the life of those walls so these you are talking of the percutaneous valves yeah of course okay fine so the life of these valves is supposed to be similar to the life of a tissue valve which is done through surgery because it is done made with the same material with the same company with the same tissue everything is the same the only the method of implantation is different so the first valve which we implanted about what now 9 years back this patient is fine okay and so we have not seen any major degeneration of the valve patients have died because of other reasons because they are elderly they are 80 years or 82 years or 85 years now they develop cancer or something like that but because of degeneration of the valve early degeneration is not seen in these valves they are very durable and uh, now the data is uh, quite positive actually because uh, it is doing as well or even better than the surgical tissue valves which were, were being done uh, so secondly what it, i wanted to know is ki i mean if the patient is maintained not the patient if a person is maintained not say 90 60 of uh, bp is there any uh, future risk for him no i mean uh, you are talking of a general person general a, person yeah of course i mean you know for a general person i can tell you one thing the lower the blood pressure the longer he will live i think my there was an anesthetist of mine in hindurao delhi and she used to maintain her bp by 96 and i just i just wanted to know sometimes the patient come to me and ask for these things uh, thirdly i mean there is a friend of mine who was operated upon in uh, medanta yes i don't know luck now uh he had a stent over there and now he was given permanent pacemaker what are the conditions when this happens so now there there are two things that you know uh, stenting is for the arteries of the heart and pacemaker is for the electrical system of the heart so, so they are independent so many patients who are above the age of 60 years they start degenerating the arteries and they also start degenerating the conduction system of the heart so if both the things are happening he will need both but many times patients just need a pacemaker or they just need angioplasty so these are not very common that not, they are not interlinked yeah. they are not interlinked they are not interlinked generally thank you very much um dr praveen uh, sir i have a question that no at 50 around 50 a person is mildly let's say i am not talking about the doctors uh, mildly hypertensive plus minus you know winters hypertensive and summers normotensive diabetes plus minus status sometime he gets fasting 120 most of the time he gets below 100 what should be uh, should he get an preventive heart checkup is there any recommendation and what sort of preventive heart checkup one should go these 50 around people doctors especially every year or two yearly are there any recommendations 
So no, I uh, I got a little confused. So any person who is above the age of fifty or around fifty, and if they are having hypertension, definitely they have to take medicines for hypertension. But if they are only hypertensive during the winter time, many times they have to just you know take the drugs during that time, and then in case they don't need it, they can even stop it. It's okay. And this is a phenomena which has been seen in. Are part of the world very commonly than other countries. Okay, so this is a common thing. You are absolutely right. And but the most important thing is that we have to control high blood pressure. You know, only yesterday one of my classmates came from Pilibhit. You know, he there in very busy practice. He was doing. And then when he came here, his blood pressure was 190, and he didn't know this. Can you believe it? He is a busy practitioner. He is seeing 250 patients every day, and This is the ignorance level, so that is why doctors should also get their tests done. At least you know uh, the blood pressure should be checked every month or two months or three months, whatever. And then once in a year you should check your lipid profile. So now the question is how to protect yourself from heart problem. I can tell you. The first thing is that you know you have to if you are hypertensive, please take medicines for blood pressure. Do not forget it. Even if we know that we have to take it, we just tend to forget it. इतने थक गए, भूल गए, and all that stuff. वो नहीं होना चाहिए. The second thing is that smoking should be controlled now because अब तक है बहुत most of the doctors don't smoke anymore. And then the third is if you are a diabetic, please take care of your diabetes. And if you are a diabetic, must take statins. Cholesterol reducing medications has to be given. Then the fourth thing is that. Uh, if the you know if uh, uh, the medicines are not controlling blood pressure please check it kya hota hai ki kai baar medicine log lete rehte hain and the blood pressure is also not controlled so you are left with matlab well, it's a false sense of security so we have to do that now how to know ki bhai kya ho sakta hai so if the cholesterol is high must take cholesterol medications and if there are any symptoms or there is any you know high risk features then a ct coronary angio is a very good test i can tell you okay. yeah it's a very good screening test because stress test why, why is it not so popular amongst the physician even no yeah because you know because of the two three things one that the accuracy of this test initially was not that good so kya hota initial wo jo ek ban jati hai picture ke isme clear nahi aata clear nahi aata then the second thing is that it is uh, you know uh, not freely available everywhere to start with now ab to har jagah ho gaya so lekin wahan pe bhi kya hai ki doctors jo hai itna trained nahi hai usko read karne ke liye like for okay. example gorakhpur i would go to gorakhpur sometimes and i advise ct angio for so many people and then i ask them to show me the report kya hai nahi ji ab teen din baad report mile kyun kyunki wo usko kahin bhejenge fir usko padhega fir wo matlab aise hi hai sir sara cheez hai to ye sari problems hai but otherwise Well, I can tell you one thing. A CT, a normal CT angio is hundred percent predictive. Okay. Okay. A normal CT angio is hundred percent predictive. No question. The only problem is that if we find a blockage in CT angio, then it has to be confirmed on a further testing. So, इसीलिए मैं कह रहा हूँ कि it says for screening purposes it is very good. So. getting a ct angio done if there are risk factors or you know some symptoms happening for a doctor i think it's a good idea if the renal functions are good do a ct angio perfect but probably uh, is there difference between 128 slices to 56 slices as well for the clarity of this yeah i mean you know the better the machine is the more accuracy will you will find but as such if you have a normal ct angio and 128 slice that's also 100% predictive So, but now most of the machines are 256 slice in all cities. I think, I think, I think Agra has, Lucknow has, everybody. Has. Yeah. So do we have any more questions? Not question, but appreciation. I think Dr. Praveen has uh, very well explained us the new things. You are not aware of it. So, thank you very much for that. And now, thank you, uh, thank Dr. Praveen. There, there are myths. No, as a doctor, I know. that there are myths even amongst the doctors for starting the hypertensive no uh, 
uh, as i talked about that winters hypertensive summers normotensive so is there really any issue that if you start those hypertensive or let's say if you are borderline hypertensive what is the right definition if most oftenly you are getting 130 84 is this a uh, indication that one should start an anti hypertensive or no no 130 84 no so any blood pressure which is above 140 by 90 definitely we have to start anti hypertensives but again the reading should be taken at least 3 to 4 times in normal working situations not under stress situations and then also uh, you know then the target is bringing it to 130 by 80 or below that is the whole thing okay so we have to start these medications and we have to titrate the medication otherwise kya rehta hai ki people take just one tablet and think ki ho gaya ji hamara bp ki dawa chal rahi hai that's not good because bp is a silent killer i can tell you everything in heart is because of the bp and diabetes andar andar sara khel ho gaya and then people come with heart attack and ki ji humne to kabhi kuch khaya nahi ye nahi kiya wo nahi kiya and then i have this thing why because we never control the blood pressure of the people so i think this is what we should look at and uh, we should not ignore ourselves regular physical activity ho jaye to acha hi rehta hai because we should do this uh, you know it's easier said than done but <laughs> certainly we should <laughs> Uh, on what level, Dr. Chandra? On what level, on uh, you would like to maintain the BP with on the patient on medication? On medication, it should be one thirty by eighty or below. On medicine again, again it, that the cut off is one forty ninety, but your target is one thirty by eighty. Okay, sure. Uh, Dr. Praveen, there is another lot of myths and fear around TAVI, especially. i had seen uh, i know my, even my relatives who are obese chronic hypertensive because mostly these are the patients who are hypertensive chronic hypertensive and obese who have aortic valve problems once you get the eco done so how actually what are the percentage no evidence base i'm talking about that people these who are highly obese 100 plus weight chronic hypertensive for almost let's say 20 years Uh, how safe the stavi as a procedure is yeah let me tell you one thing although i am i am doing it uh, for the last so many years so i may be a little biased but in general i can tell you it is a very very safe procedure because uh, it has kind of evolved now it has become very routine jaise ki pehle tha na aap logo ka knee knee transplant in delhi mein ho raha hai ab to everywhere it is being done and it is being done with such perfection you know everywhere we are getting good results it's because it has evolved people have developed the techniques so tavi has evolved although it is still not very common in many many centers but we are you know finding a very good outcome with these tavi tavi patients and you know they recover very fast the valve is very durable and the chance of complication is also very low once you have done so many procedures it becomes very predictable it's it's i you know we are kind of doing almost every week we do 3 4 3 4 so it's okay right. yeah yeah so if we don't have any more questions then can we spare our guest speaker today after such an heavy session and bombardment of questions from orthopedic surgeons <laughs> uh, so sir thank you very much for joining us today it was really a wonderful insight into so many cardiac problems even i have learned as a clinician that what are things to be done so thank you again everybody before, for i know before i finish i have one question please please at, uh, on medicine sometimes you find that the bp is uh, some uh, leveling in somewhere 130 or 140 130 or 9, uh, 90 in the morning and then in the evening it comes down <clears throat> to say 110 by 70 so and and it's a regular feature then what is to be done what is the reason behind that yeah so these are diurnal variations also in the body so we have to adjust the dose of medications and the timing of medications in a way that it doesn't fluctuate too much so you know in general very common terms i tell my patients that jo bulb zyada fluctuate karte hain wo jaldi fuse ho jate hain isliye bulb ko bahut zyada fluctuate mat hone do timtimane mat do usko ek ya to slowly jale ya tezi jale 
तो बेटर ये है कि उसका वोल्टेज सही रखिए एंड वोल्टेज सही रखने के लिए वी हैव टू जस्ट री एडजस्ट द मेडिकेशन मेनी टाइम्स एंड दैट हेल्प एंड दैट इज वाई आई कैन टेल यू वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग दर इज अ टेस्ट दीज डेज इट इज वेरी मच रिकमेंडेड for every patient who is hypertensive they must do a 24 hour ambulatory monitoring okay because ye dekha gaya ki jin patients mein bp raat ke time dip nahi karta hai they have a very high chance of developing heart attacks and that is why you see patients develop heart attacks in the night time and the very early morning because they are now known as iski nayi definition as non dippers so hypertension दिन के टाइम में बिल्कुल मस्त घूम रहे हैं कोई सिम्टम नहीं है बीपी एक दो बार चेक करा है सब ठीक है बट वेन दे चेक द ट्वेंटी फोर आवर एम्बुलेटरी बीपी देन वी फाइंड आउट कि ये गड़बड़ हो गई सो इन दीज पेशेंट्स वी शुड डू अ ट्वेंटी फोर आवर एम्बुलेटरी मॉनिटरिंग एज यू आस्ट ऑफ रमन एंड वी हैव टू एडजस्ट द मेडिसिन डोज इन टाइमिंग अकॉर्डिंग I think अपने क्लिनिक चैम्बर्स और अपने हॉस्पिटल में अपना बीपी चेक करना बंद कर दे वेन वी आर रिलैक्स ओनली देन वी शुड चेक इट <laughs> and on how, how what is the protocol for checking this bp check test uh, checked every day or on when once you are on medications yeah once you are on the medication dekhiye wahi wali baat hai initially if it is not controlled then you have to check it every day once it is controlled maan lo 3 din 4 din tak aapko lag raha bilkul theek hai then you start doing it once in a week and once in a week you find it everything is okay you do it once in a month but you know this is how you can adjust because you do also do not want to be a psychological wreck yeah yeah har din leg bed pe bp check kar rahe ho sare ghar wale pareshan karenge kya hoga so are there are there any clinical symptoms which develop if your yeah. bp is not yeah dekhiye sir ki clinical alarming symptom or something yeah, like that the common symptoms are people become edgy big bill become agar aap hospital mein aapko zyada gussa aa raha hai matlab samajhiye ki bp bad raha hai aapka ya ghar mein gussa aa raha hai bp bad raha hai then irritability unsteadiness light headedness you know breathlessness kai bar hota hai ki aap tez chal rahe hain aapko saans swelling in the feet is also very common headache unexplained headache jaise beech mein headache hona shuru ho gaya so those are the i think common features of uh, hypertension and can one question away from this subject that uh, you said that in uh, in covid times you have used lot of in lot many patients you have used ecmo Yeah. So what was exactly the results of ECMO? I mean, how because uh, patients undergoing treatment in ICUs and if they have gone into a ventilator, the success rate was supposed to be very less. So Absolutely. what was the success rate of this the success, ECMO? Yeah. The success rate of this second? ECMO is dependent on the basic disease. Since the basic disease was very bad, so any disease which is reversible. So in patients, may निमोनिया थोड़ा बेटर हो गया इन्फ्लेमेशन कम हो गया वो तो इम्प्रूव कर गए बट आई थिंक एटी परसेंट पेशेंट डिड नॉट इम्प्रूव सो दैट इज वाई इट इज नॉट रिकमेंडेड ओनली फॉर दोज पेशेंट वेर इट इज नॉट टू लेट वेर दू नो दैट दू नो देर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट हैव रिकवर देन इट इज अ गुड आइडिया जैसे कि अब मान लीजिए कि पलमरी इम्बोलिज्म हो गया किसी को अब आपको मालूम है कि वो रिकवर कर सकता है क्योंकि एम्बोलिज्म में थ्रोम्बस डिजोल्व हो सकता है आफ्टर सम टाइम तो दीज पेशेंट्स विल रिकवर सो फॉर एग्जांपल आपके यहाँ मान लो ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जरी आपने करी उसको पलमरी एम्बोलिज्म हो गया पेशेंट बीपी एकदम से ड्रॉप कर रहा है दैट इज द पेशेंट वेर एक्मो कैन हेल्प बाई ऑक्सीजनेटिंग आपने उसको बाईपास कर दिया एंड देन वंस द क्लॉट डिजोल्व देन यू कैन हाँ जी हाउ लॉन्ग यू फाइब्रोटिक लंग्स में वर्क नहीं कर करना फाइब्रोटिक अगर रिवर्सिबल ही नहीं है कंडीशन इफ द कंडीशन इज नॉट रिवर्सिंग हाउ लॉन्ग विल यू कीप द पेशेंट ऑन एक्मो एक्मो के भी अपने अलग कॉम्प्लिकेशंस हैं कि एक्मो में ब्लड थिनर्स चलते हैं और ब्लीडिंग हो सकती है एंड देन लिंब इस्कीमिया हो सकता है बिकॉज़ दे आर वेरी थिक कैनुलास दैट्स हाउ इट इज सो हाउ लॉन्ग यू कैन कीप सर पेशेंट ऑन एक्मो How long? I mean, you you can technically you can keep them for about you know three weeks or four weeks, no problem. But then they start developing all these complications of infection. अच्छा फिर क्या होता है एक्मो के बाद we transfer these patients on a LVAD और इसको कहते हैं heart med LVAD पे डाल देते हैं जो कि implant हो जाता है body के अंदर. But the point is you know then you know what happens is they are very expensive, they are tedious, all those things are there. so i think it's time to thank you sir thank you very much
thank you thank you thanks a lot sir. sir thank you everybody for joining us today thank you everyone thank you dr and Kupin, thank sir. you ashok thank sham for conducting this wonderful thank you sir thank you you are always good and best thanks sir ashok has started a very good thing